Well, good morning, Bridgeway. How was everybody? It's good to see everyone. We had an awesome time at our family picnic last week, and we hope you guys had lots of fun. Lots of pictures up online for you to look at. Uh, we're going to worship together this morning, so would you stand as we sing this old hymn, How Great Thou Art. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome to Bridgeway. If it's your first time with us, 
There's a QR code on the uh, seat in front of you. We don't have bulletins today. Uh, the printer broke, okay? We're not doing away with bulletins. Remember, I tried that once. It was a revolt in the church. Uh, the printer's not acting right. So no bulletins today. But for each uh, guest information we get, we donate $10 to a Child's Hope International, and that $10 feeds a child for an entire month. Bridgeway Preschool uh, Meetup. If you're interested in that, you can talk to Bailey. Where's Bailey at? <laughs> right there in the back. And uh, she can tell you more about that. There is a cleaning team meeting today after service. You'll be talking with Miss Jackie. And so she'll be, uh, she's in the kids wing right now. But um, just a reminder about that. Our t-shirts to benefit Bernie and Sue are still for sale. Um, we're going to have this for sale until next Sunday. And so we've had actually quite a few that have already been sold. And the proceeds, of course, go to benefit Bernie and Sue, which, again, church, we're grateful for how you've loved on them uh, during this season uh, of life for them. Our Back to School Bash, this is for our students, is next Sunday night. And so um, that's going to be at Woodland Lakes, by the way, uh, parents of students. And so that's 5 p.m. Bring stuff to swim in as well. Uh, this is part of our United Student Ministry, which is a ministry we have here at Bridgeway, along with seven other churches locally. Um, we combine to uh, do events, and uh, it goes really well. Tonight is actually the Bridgeway Bible Club, so if you have a fourth or fifth grader, that's tonight, uh, same time, 5 p.m., that'll be here at the church. Um, before we go to prayer, a couple things. We, we had a vote on uh, Jerry Cole for trustee and Andrew McGee. Uh, for Deacon, and it was unanimous. Yeah, unanimous yes for them to become. I almost voted no, because like, it felt wrong. Do we have to be unanimous on this? But um, So we're grateful to have them. Jerry, if you throw your hand up, and give it up for Jerry. Andrew and his family are out of town, and so um, we'll, uh, we'll clap for him next Sunday, I guess. But um, we're going to go to prayer church, and... Um, at Bridgeway, we celebrate with those who are celebrating. We weep with those who are weep because that's what a faith family does. And um, we want to continue to pray for Bernie and Sue as Bernie still battles his cancer. And then um, our good friend Mike Davidson um, just mentioned this morning, his brother Tim, who's only 50, uh, was diagnosed with stage four bone cancer. And uh, that's not the end of Tim's story. You know, um, we're going to be praying uh, and requesting to the Lord to, to heal Tim. And uh, Tim is a believer, and so we take comfort in that uh, considerably. But we want to lift Tim up and his family. Um, I believe he has six kids, Mike, six kids. Um, many still living at home. So let's pray for uh, Tim this morning, church. Let's bow together. Almighty Father, we are so grateful and humbled to be able to gather today with other believers uh, to sing to you, Lord, to hear from your word. God, we turn to you because you're the almighty God. You're the one who created us. You're the one who loves us. And we know you love Tim and you love his family. And God, we know that in this life we'll have tribulation, we'll have trials, we'll have difficulties. That's a guarantee. But you promised that you'd be with us in the midst of those things. And so we pray for this, this difficult time for Tim's family, that they um, can feel and know your comfort, Lord. Our request to you today, Lord, is for a miracle to take place, for Tim to be healed. And God, we will give you praise and glory for that. I pray for Mike. I know this is his brother, and that's that's difficult, a uh, difficult thing to shoulder and to bear. And so we pray for the entire Davidson family this morning, Lord. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together. We'll continue singing this morning. Uh, Rebecca, I forgot to tell you, we're going to switch these two songs here. So we have the next song. How deep the Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make a wretch His treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turned His face away as wounds which mar the chosen one Bring men the sons to glory
Amen. All righty. Well, uh, it's the first Sunday of the month, and the first Sunday of the month here at Bridgeway is a catechism question that we cover, so we'll be doing that today. But before we get into that, I just, uh, you know, last Sunday was, I'm still on a spiritual high from last Sunday. I don't know about you guys, but that was, it filled me up. Uh, we baptized six. Uh, I got to watch two dads baptize their children, and then uh, Dan uh, Quino uh, went public with his faith, and I, I love Dan's testimony. Uh, we've been working on Dan for years, you know, and um, what, a, what a blessing uh, to be a part of that. And you know, July was a weird month for us. Uh, we don't normally talk about how many people show up on Sunday mornings. Not that it's not important, but our main focus isn't to say we're a church of this many people. Um, we just want to be a church that loves God, loves others, and serves like Jesus. But metrics do tell you some things. And um, July, for whatever reason, was the largest, as far as Sunday mornings go, was the largest month ever for our church. Um, yeah, you can clap if you want. <laughs> Mel was like, do I clap or do I not? Uh, which was weird because July and August are traditionally the two lowest months of the year. August, everyone's finishing up their vacations, which I don't blame you. I mean, I just got back from vacation and uh, you're know, making memories with your family, all that good stuff. But uh, it's neat. It's neat to see God at work uh, among us. So I'm, I'm just grateful. I just wanted to share that. It's good stuff. It really is. Uh, so we do a catechism question the first Sunday of the month. The reason we do that is we want to give people a framework for their theology. We've been walking through the Gospel of John. We're going to start the Gospel of John chapter 7 next Sunday, which I'm excited about diving into that chapter. Um, but the purpose, again, of a catechism is to give you a framework, give you a skeleton to put some meat on. It's not meant to be overly deep, but it does give you at least an on-ramp for studying some things. We've looked at some foundational questions, you know, uh, what is uh, the Old Testament? What's the New Testament? How do we get our Bible? How do we understand the Bible? Uh, and those are foundational. And so we, we wanted to lay a good foundation. And we're going to add to that foundation today because we, I believe there's two books God has written. There's, not, don't freak out. I'm not going to say the Book of Mormon. All right. Some of you are like, here he goes. He's losing it. But God has given us his word. He's also given us his creation. And as we're going to see, scripture tells us, you know, we can learn things about God from what he has created. That uh, this book does tell us some things. And what does it tell us? But the next three, at least the next three, I don't know how many we're going to do. We're going to deal with questions concerning arguments for the existence of God. And if you've been a part of Bridgeway for any amount of time, you know, these are things we have covered in the past. But again, I'm looking at it from this viewpoint of what am I teaching uh, my children at, at home? And I know the catechism isn't just for kids. It's for adults because I'm probably asking questions maybe you haven't thought about. But uh, what foundation do I want my children to have when it comes to their faith? What questions do I want them to be able to answer? And so we're, in, we're laying the groundwork. And each generation <clears throat> asked different questions. And the current generation uh, I think in a lot of ways, they ask a lot more difficult questions than maybe the questions that were asked when I was younger, or if you're, you're older, you know, the questions maybe that were asked when you, when you were a kid. And I think doing, part of that is because of the internet, right? And social media and YouTube, uh, they have access to more information and more challenging questions. And so the starting point for some people isn't, you know, uh, what they think about Jesus. It's, does God even exist? And there are arguments we can make that, you know, give us good reasons to believe that God exists. And every Christian should at least know some of them. Now, there's over like 20 some odd. Uh, and, and some of them are way, uh, I, there's no way I could explain it because some of them are just over my head. Like, we're not going to get into the ontological uh, argument for the existence of God because it's just, I can't wrap my head around it. And if I can't wrap my head around it, how am I going to? help you guys wrap your heads around it. But <clears throat> there are three that I think are essential for every Christian to at least be able to articulate. One being uh, the moral argument for God's existence. We're going to cover that, not today, but uh, we will get to that one. 
and that's basically talking about you know objective morality and so on and so forth. The tele- it's called the teleological argument, but it really means the fine-tuning argument of the universe. Why does the universe look so designed? Uh, it's because there's a designer. But today we're going to start, again, this is foundationally, we're going to start with the, it's called the cosmological argument for God's existence. And we have flashcards for each catechism that we do, and uh, we've changed colors because we're on a different topic. We're not on the Bible now, we're on uh, this uh, topic, what is the cosmological argument? And the argument goes like this, everything that begins to exist has a cause or an explanation of its existence. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And we're going we're gonna to dissect that here uh, today. 1 Peter 3 says this, <clears throat> But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense. That word means, uh, it comes from the Greek apologia. A defense. That's where we get the, our word apologetics from. To anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that is in you. So you should be able to at least make some arguments for why you believe what you believe. Why do you believe God exists? Just try to answer that question right now in your mind. Why do you believe it? Do you believe it because the preacher believes it? Uh, because your parents believed it? And those are, those are, you know, not great answers. I mean, I'm glad my parents believed in God and took me and my brothers to church and did what they should in dis- helping us uh, be discipled and grow. But believing in it just because mom and dad did is not a great reason. You need to have better reasons than that. Why do you believe God exists? You have a reason. A reason is a cause or an explanation or a justification for an action or event or a belief. And God has given us a mind, and this mind is able to reason and use logic and understand things. Now, I will say the arguments we're going to go over... um, how do I want to put this? Faith is, as it says in Hebrews 1, faith is the reality of what's hoped for, the proof of what's seen. Faith involves two facets, intellectual assent, radical trust. I got to have good reasons to believe something, but then I need to actually believe it. And so the arguments I'm going to give you today, uh, I, I think they're, they're more head arguments than anything else. Uh, we still have got to take a step of faith and get to the heart. Um, And the argument I'm going to give you today, it's just going to say basically that we have good evidence that God exists. It doesn't say which God exists in this argument. Uh, We get to that later because we believe this is the God of the Bible. Um, And we have, again, good reason to believe that. There is a place for logic and reason within Christianity. This is not something where we just have blind faith. We just believe it because we can't answer certain questions. And we have good reasons to believe that God exists, good reason to believe in Christ, good reasons to believe he resurrected. We have good reasons for it. I loved in my my conversation with Dan, and he won't care that I'm sharing this. Uh, Dan and I went down many of these rabbit holes in talking about logic and reason. Again, everyone else has different starting points. And if you remember Dan's testimony last week, he was, uh, let's see, Dan was 42 years old the first time he ever went to church in his entire life. And that was at Bridgeway when we were at, at the, uh, uh, the camp when we had our, our family picnic four years ago. And then last week at the family picnic, Dan got baptized. But he was an atheist, uh, an agnostic, which an atheist doesn't believe there is a God. An agnostic just says, you can't know that there's a God. And, and so uh, me and Dan had a lot of these great conversations. And one of the beautiful things that he said last week, uh, when we were in my office, uh, two weeks ago rather, when we were in my office after ser- uh, service, he said, you know, I know there's a place for logic and reason, but there's also a place for the heart in all of this. There is a place for the heart. And there is. With the, you know, uh, there's a, this gap sometimes between our head and our heart. And so... That's where we have intellectual assent, but we have, I have radical trust in Jesus Christ and his resurrection. So <clears throat> uh, I think this argument's going to be something that can, can help you uh, give, give some, some reasons of the hope that's in you, as it says there uh, in the scripture we just read. Everybody on this planet has asked the question, where do I come from? Everybody has either asked it or they've thought about it. And everyone must wrestle with it. You have to. I I guess you could ignore it, but that's ignoring the obvious. Where did we come from? 
And the question is, why is there something rather than nothing? Because nothing always produces nothing. That's profound, right? What did you learn at church today? Well, the pastor said nothing produces nothing. Color you shocked, right? Everything we see comes from something. Look at these beautiful trusts in our, our church building here. Presbyterians know how to build a building, right, Mike? Or Mark? Because Calvin Presbyterian is the one who built this. They know how to build a beautiful place. And the first thing that strikes you when you walk in this building are these trusts. And if you've not been here, you're watching online, that's your invitation. You've got to come in person and see this. And um, I asked Mike Storch this morning, I said, what kind of wood are these trusts made of? And uh, he said, pine, right? Yellow leaf pine. I believe you were very particular about that. All these trusts that you see it was a tree in a forest or in the woods or in a, wherever they grow trees, you know, for commercial reasons. It grew. Started off that little uh, pine cone, right? And then grew into this tree and then that tree gets cut down. And here it is. Now that pine cone that made these trees came from another pine tree, Right? And then that pine cone came from another pine tree. And you guys see where I'm going with this. We just keep going back. And where'd that first pine cone come from? You know what I mean? It's like the, the chicken and the egg kind of question. Everything that begins to exist, including trees, has a cause. Something caused it to come into existence. Now, the universe began to exist, just like that tree began to grow. So what's the best explanation for that? That's, all, that's really all we're trying to get to. Now, this is not an anti-science conversation. I think there, there's this false dilemma, this false dichotomy that you have to choose faith or science. And I don't believe that to be the case. Because I think they can go hand in hand and many times do. In fact, those who are the pioneers of the scientific method were Christians, by the way. And so <clears throat> they're not mutually exclusive. Science can help us understand some things. But it can only go so far. Alan Sandage, an astronomer, said this, Science can only answer a fixed type of question. It is concerned with what, when, and how. It does not, and indeed cannot, answer within its method, powerful as the method is, why. Science can tell us the universe had a beginning, but it can't tell us why it came into existence. While scientists jump to answer this notoriously difficult question, why is there something rather than nothing, scientific observation is not well suited to finding the cosmic will that the question implies. So basically we're asking, okay, at the end of this, which is more reasonable to believe? Because sometimes as Christians get painted as fools, and it's okay to be painted as a fool for Christ's sake. You know, I'm a follower of Jesus, and sometimes people are going to think that's crazy. But which is more crazy to believe in? That everything we know came into existence out of absolutely nothing. And nothing was behind it. Or something was behind it, which is more reasonable to believe. Psalms 119 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the expanse proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day they pour out speech. Night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to the whole earth, and their words to the ends of the world. And the, uh, the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming from his home. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to their other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. So the, the Bible here is telling us that nature declares the glory of God. It's telling us something. What is it saying? 
There's, again, a lot to learn from what God has created. Romans 1, since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. So you can understand things about God's eternal power, his divine nature, through what he has made. Science is not something that is in conflict of faith. In fact, they go hand in hand. Nature speaks. So what is it saying? Now, our next catechism will get into the design argument. That kind of unpacks this a little bit. But we're going to go back to the very beginning of all of this. And the implications that has for you and for this world. Think about it this way. 1968. I was not alive then. I wasn't even a twinkle in my parents' eyes. But 1968, the Apollo 8 mission did an orbit around the moon. And as they're orbiting, and this is on Christmas Eve, I believe it was, They read words that are in the most translated, most popular, the best-selling book in all of human history. They read these words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, that'd be an awesome place to read those words, looking at all of that. (laughs) The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It had a beginning. Now, of course, scientific community doesn't uh, catch, uh, uh, get on board with that until the 20th century, 19th and 20th. But it had a beginning. Now, whatever your thoughts are on age of the earth and that kind of stuff, we can, we can debate those things. But as uh, Professor John Lennox put it, the greatest aspect, the greatest takeaway from creation is that it happened. It took place. All of this began. And this, of course, is discovered... Uh, Edwin Hubble had this uh, idea, a discovery of an expanding universe. Einstein confirmed it with his theory of general relativity. And so their thought was, if the universe is expanding, if you were to press reverse, it would come back into uh, what's called a singularity, a starting point. All of this began. Because the previous thought was that the universe has just always existed. But if it began to exist, it kind of lines up with what we're told in the very first verse of Scripture. Nobel Prize winner Dr. Arno Penzias said this, the best data we have are precisely what I would have predicted had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. Does the Bible talk about there being a beginning? It does. We just read one verse. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. We talked about that many chapters ago in our study of John, if you'd like to check it out. Hebrews 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the Word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Revelation 4, our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power because you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. That's the cosmological argument. Why is that so important? Why... Why is this so incredibly important to to know? Because ideas have consequences. In our world today, especially with uh, secular humanism and all all these different worldviews that are colliding now, and of course, uh, the the ever-increasing popular belief that there is 
know God, does that idea have a consequence? Yeah. Underlying that idea is that you are nothing but an accident. You're not even supposed to be here. And that this life is all that there is. And one day you will not be here whatsoever. You're just here for this little blimp. That's it. That's all you get. Has that affected people's mental health? I'd say that plays a part of it. I know there's a lot of different factors in there. But you take God out of the equation, you take purpose out of the equation. There is no purpose for you to be here. Yeah, you can make them up as you see fit, but there's no ultimate purpose for your being. You came from nothing and to nothing you shall return. As Richard Dawkins would say, the, uh, the atheist uh, biologist, he said, we are all essentially dancing to the rhythm of our DNA. Some people get lucky, some people get unlucky. And his, his, uh, he had a campaign in Great Britain where he, he got a bunch of billboards and, and uh, a bunch of signs on buses that said, there's probably no God, now go enjoy your life. Which, if it was more accurate, it would have been him saying, there's probably no God, now go enjoy your meaningless, purposeless life. Because that's what it is at the end of the day. And do we live in a world where people struggle with purpose? Do we live in a world where people struggle with direction? They don't even know why they're here. And they've been told God's not a likely equation in all of this. So, you know, there's probably other ideas. You, no. This is why this is foundational. People lack a foundation. They don't have a solid rock to stand on. So when those storms come, I mean, it just falls apart. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand all other ground sinking sand, right? Many people lack that foundation. This Alan Sandage guy, the astronomer, I'm going to quote him a few more times, but he was an atheist, and it was through his astronomy that he ended up becoming a Christian. He said, I find it quite improbable that such order came out of chaos. There had to be some organizing principle. God, to me, is a mystery. At this time, he wasn't sure about God. But he is the explanation for the miracle of existence, why there is something rather than nothing. He couldn't quite wrap his mind around God, but eventually he did. Next quote, please. I don't have this one in my notes because I, I literally just found it. It was my science that drove me to the conclusion that the world is much more complicated than can be explained by science. It is only through the supernatural that I can understand the mystery of existence. And he, of course, became a believer. Lee Strobel, famous for writing The Case for Christ, he said, to continue in my atheism, I would need to believe that nothing produces everything. Non-life produces life. Randomness produces fine-tuning. Chaos produces information. Unconsciousness produces consciousness. And non-reason produces reason. I simply didn't have that much faith. We need to bring these arguments up early in church. I was listening to a speaker this past week who said children's worldviews start becoming solidified by the time they're 11. Not saying that they can't change their minds later on, but your 10 and 11-year-old are thinking about these things in their own way, but they're thinking about it. So we should have these conversations. Parents, outside of church and church activity, what are you doing to disciple your kids? That's, that's the question you need to answer. What are you doing to show them what a Christian should be like? What questions are you asking that they're going to wrestle with? And this is what has driven me more than anything. Again, I grew up in church. I never heard these questions growing up in church. And I don't blame the churches I grew up in. They, they weren't thinking about those kinds of questions per se. But these need to be answered. What really has driven me in this is the fact that I have children. I grow up in a world that are asking these questions. And they need to have an answer. 
They need to know that what they believe is not just blind faith, that this is not something we just take because dad believes it, because it's real and it's foundational and it's important. And there are good reasons for our faith. Every Christian should know them. Now, the question that normally comes up in this argument is, okay, Brent, everything that began to exist has a cost. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cost. Who made God? Maybe that's the question that's popping up in your mind. Brent, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Where did God come from? I think that's a great question. That's a solid question. So how do we wrestle with that one? Well, the law of cause and effect would, would say there has to be some first cause. What do I mean by that? Well, if we could find out, okay, let's say God, something created God. What created the thing that created God? And we could find that out. What created the thing that created the thing that created God? And then we keep going back. Well, what created the thing that created the thing that created the thing that created? You would have what's called an infinite regress. At some point, there has to be a first cause to affect everything else. There has to be. So think about it this way. Either the, either the universe is eternal or God is eternal. One of the two have to be eternal. And we have good reason to believe that the universe is not. And what do we learn? About, what, think about this. What do we learn from this? Whatever created all of this has to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial because time, space, and matter all came into existence. So whatever brought this into being, whatever the first cause is, is not bound by time, space, or matter. In fact, is also incredibly powerful. Now I phrase that as a question because obviously I believe when you look in the Bible, you find the answer to what that whatever is. The Bible gives us information that God existed before all of this. He exists outside of time. Psalm 90, before the mountains were brought forth or ever he had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. First Timothy, now to the king are eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord, the one who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty Hebrews 3, now every house is built by someone, but the one who built everything is God. I love that one. Everybody, you're, you know your house is built by somebody. The one who built everything, God. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. God doesn't fit that category. You know why? Because he never began to exist. He's always existed. Always. Wrap your head around that one, right? How do I wrap my head around that? I can't. I can't wrap my head around eternity. I can't remember who said it, but basically uh, the, the quote was something along the lines of, if, if God is small enough to be completely understood, he's not big enough to worship. Also the quote, and again, I can't remember who said it, it's just coming to my mind, that God is not so much an object of comprehension as much as he is a source of holy curiosity. If you can comprehend all there is to know about God, I'm gonna say right here, you're not telling the truth. He's incomprehensible. Doesn't mean he's not knowable, okay? Don't confuse the two. Just because something is incomprehensible doesn't mean you can't know things about it. God is incomprehensible. You will never completely grasp, but he's given you enough where you can believe on him. He's given you enough.
but he never began to exist. It would be like asking the question, what does the color blue smell like? Well, blue is just a color. It doesn't have a smell. Blueberries do. But the color blue is in a category of colors. God is in a category all himself. There is no one like him. We just sang that. There is no one like you. I forget the rest of the song or I keep singing it. <laughs> he is in a category by himself. He's the everlasting one. He is the three in one, the triune, holy God. Maybe there's people, maybe there are people that you love, people that you know, people that you work with. Who their, their, their worldview is, yeah, there is no God. I think this is a good stepping point to helping them understand that, hey, maybe there is a God, and here's some reasons why I believe that. And just ask them questions. Where do you think all this came from? You don't even have to share your worldview at this point. Well, where did all this come from? The Big Bang. Okay, where did the Big Bang come from? You see, I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day. He's talking with a scientist. And I like hearing their viewpoints because we don't agree most of the time on many things, religiously speaking. And Joe Rogan said this, and he's not a Christian. I pray one day he becomes one. But he said, you know, science just needs one miracle. That's all it needs. It has to have it. It needs one miracle, and that miracle is that everything came from nothing. But that's just it. (laughs) If science is going to grant one miracle, you have to have a miracle worker. You have to have a miracle worker. Because miracles just don't happen. So maybe you're in this room, maybe you're watching online, and you're like, Brent, I don't know if God exists. Man, I think there's good reasons to believe he does. Where did all this come from? Where do you think it came from? It came from somewhere. It came from something. And I think that something is a someone, God Almighty. Now, how do you go from here to Christianity? Again, because all we've gotten to in this conversation this morning is just a theism. That there is a God. How do I know it's the God of the Bible? And I'm just going to do this really fast. Because, again, I'm not trying to answer that other question today. I'm just trying to put a skeleton out there. You can put some meat on it. The God who created everything out of nothing stepped into our existence. He had a ministry of three years. He was telling folks that he would be killed. They would kill him. Now, you don't have to believe Jesus is God, but uh, Jesus was a human being, uh, historically speaking. Maybe you don't believe he's God at this point. But here's the kicker. If, if this, this Jesus walked around and they killed him and he just stayed dead, then you would be right. He would just be another dude. But he walked around saying, they're going to kill me. And then three days later, I'm coming back. And guess what took place? That right there. He came back. You don't have Christianity without a resurrected Jesus. You do not have Christianity without a resurrected Jesus. If Jesus stayed dead, Christianity as we know it would have ended 2,000 years ago. I promise you that. There's no way these apostles are going to die for something that they knew was a lie. They weren't going to do it. They had nothing to gain. This isn't like L. Ron Hubbard creating Scientology so he could become rich. You know what I mean? This is something these guys had nothing to gain, everything to lose. And they went to their graves saying, he resurrected from the dead. And so if you can go around saying you're God and they kill you and you come back, guess what that means? You're God. And you would be wise to follow him. There is a God. That means there's purpose to your life. That means there's meaning to your life. That means there is, there is an origin story for you. There is a place you came from, from Almighty. You're made in his image. 
and that there is something after this. And you'd be wise to believe it. Let's bow together, church, and have a moment of prayer. Again, I thank you for your time. Once again, our purpose today was to just put some, uh, put a skeleton out there to put some meat on. I, I hope it gives you some things to think about. Maybe if you don't believe in God, I, I hope this argument can be something that perhaps will help you in your, your journey. All of this came from somewhere. Where do you think it came from? I think the best explanation, the explanation that makes the most sense is that there is a God who brought all of this into existence and that this God is not like us. He exists outside of time, space, and matter, that he is incredibly powerful. He's timeless, spaceless, immaterial, but he did step into our existence and took on flesh, took on the form of a servant, the Bible says, and he submitted himself to death to be crucified on a cross, became obedient, the Bible says, to death on a cross. And then he resurrected. So if you're here today and you struggle with belief in God, I would love to talk to you. I'd love to give you a reason, the reasons of the hope that's within me. Why I believe that there's much more to this life than just this life. So if you're watching online, if you wouldn't mind to put a question mark in the comment section or message us, um, I personally will follow up with you. If you're in this room, I'm gonna be down here up front right after we sing this song. I'd love to talk to you, and if I can't, Pastor Brandon will be there as well. We wanna help you with this. To my, my Christian friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, this is an argument you should know, and you should know it well, because you need to be able to give a reason of the hope that is in you. There are people who need you to share these truths with them. And so if this is something that was new to you today, grab one of those flashcards, memorize it, watch the sermon over and over and, and be able to build a case for your belief. Lord God, I thank you that you settled this long ago in the first verse of the Bible. You're the one who brought all of this into existence. The implications that has for everyone is huge. But there is a God And then you show us that you love us by stepping into our existence, dying on a cross and resurrecting so we could have forgiveness of sin in relationship with the one who created us. How beautiful that is, Lord. And maybe there's some folks in this room today that don't believe that yet. Maybe they still have questions to ask. I pray they would have the courage to ask those questions. For those of us who know the answer, who know the way, the truth, and the life, I pray that we can prepare ourselves to give a reason of the hope that's in us. Because there is a world around us who doesn't think you exist, Lord. And we need to be able to share the truth with them. So I pray that we educate ourselves and that we're bold with what we have learned. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing before we're dismissed. We fall down. We lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and the feet of Jesus and we cry holy, holy, holy we cry holy, holy, holy we cry holy, holy, holy no more fears the feet of Jesus. Grace abounds to all who found, found the feet of Jesus. And we cry, holy, holy, holy.
guys, Curtis Smith. We'll see you next week. <laughs>